Hey everybody, welcome back. One of the most frustrating issues when recovering from betrayal trauma is the ongoing emotional flooding resulting from loss, deception, reminders, and even intrusive thoughts. Long after a couple commits to the work on the marriage, this fire-breathing trauma dragon continues to raise its ugly head and scorch the progress that a couple makes. Rick calls it a dragon because this type of trauma appears as if it comes out of nowhere only to ruthlessly attack you. This dragon of trauma is difficult to describe, so for those around you who don't know this kind of pain, it's gonna seem imaginary to them. For you though, it feels so big and so impossible to manage that recovery feels utterly impossible. So this week I'm gonna talk about what I think is one of the number one obstacles to recovery, but bear with me for a couple of minutes on some brain basics. Several weeks ago, I had a question about how dopamine creates intense needs. It's very similar to how a drug addiction affects the brain, which tells the brain, you must have the pleasurable experience to survive. Those who are addicted and those who are traumatized are influenced by that same primitive part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is in charge of our fight or flight reaction. It functions much like the brain of a reptile. If you've ever owned a reptile, you know how incapable they are of relationship. They are about two things. What can they eat and avoid what might eat them? I'm told that if an alligator isn't hungry and feels no sense of danger, it's safe to approach that alligator. If that alligator is hungry or senses danger, however, it will attack even someone who's been feeding it for years. The amygdala stores memories and images and constantly watches for anything that may pose a threat. But unfortunately, we don't know what's been imprinted as a trigger for that fight or flight response. Let's break down how your brain processes a potential threat. I was walking my daughter's dog last week through my favorite park around this lake, and she stirred up a snake that was sunning itself. I saw the snake out of the corner of my eye. I jumped and twisted at least two feet into the air, and I even scared the lady behind me. We both had a good laugh after that. I might have also screamed like an eight-year-old child. I'm not going to admit to that. Using the example of seeing a snake on the ground, first, my amygdala, which is constantly on guard, triggers the sympathetic nervous system. That's the emotional accelerator. And in one two hundredth of a second, adrenaline is released. My heart rate jumps to over a hundred and you leap out of harm's way. Next, the prefrontal cortex analyzes the type of snake to determine whether it poses a risk. And if it perceives no danger, it triggers the parasympathetic nervous system, which operates the brakes on our emotional system. This alarm system is crucial for the survival of our species. What would happen if, instead of immediately reacting, we were to stand there trying to discern the type of snake and whether it poses a risk? I'd have two feign marks in my leg long before I could determine whether to jump out of the way or not. At other times, anger, which is a part of that fight response, is critical if we're to survive. Reacting, then determining the potential risk significantly decreases our odds of survival in the wild, but it's not always helpful in our day-to-day -day life. Reacting, and then determining the potential risk significantly increases our odds of survival in the wild, but it's not always helpful in our day-to-day -day life, especially with those that we live with or connected to or have a romantic relationship with. The amygdala is constantly adapting to its present environment. Circumstances where there's fear, or pain, shame, guilt, disrespect, insults, physical danger, and injury are just a few of the life experiences that can be marked by the amygdala as something to watch out for in order to survive. 
And generally, our survival system tends to hum along just fine unless we experience a trauma. The amygdala, when triggered, stomps on our emotional accelerator, causing us to react with either anger or by running away. The prefrontal cortex evaluates the situation to determine if there is a current danger. And if none exists, it slams on our emotional brakes. This system is dependent on the prefrontal cortex being able to make sense of what's happening so it can send the other parts of the brain the appropriate signals to begin to calm down. But here's where the severity of this process sets in. Severe trauma overloads the prefrontal cortex and effectively it cuts the brake line to the parasympathetic nervous system, leaving us like a car with the accelerator stuck on the floorboard and no brakes. The trauma of infidelity more often than not produces this effect for a season. Our amygdala is always on watch. It'll spot a reminder of the infidelity and trigger the sympathetic nervous system, setting off overwhelming emotional flooding. The trauma of betrayal makes it very difficult for the person to regain control in that moment. Without a plan to eventually shift focus and diffuse these reminders, the future of the marriage and potential recovery is not only painful and overwhelming, it's almost always uncertain. If you remember the assignment that I gave you last week for the unfaithful spouse to create a list of reminders that their partner may have on any given day, a lot of times you don't even need to go into a big long discussion about what reminders and triggers are. We just need to name them and feel felt when the unfaithful spouse can express even just a little bit of empathy. It goes a long way. I believe that even having a basic understanding of how our brain works can be a powerful tool in recovery. You know, the brain is the only thing on the planet that can study itself. And understanding the realities of the trauma caused by infidelity and what can be done to heal can equip you to move forward in recovery, albeit slowly, so be gracious to yourself and respectful to each other. If you're a wayward spouse and in need of support and a structured process, I'd really encourage you to check out the Hope for Healing course developed by Rick Reynolds and offered by A Fair Recovery. You'll get a time-tested and proven program with lots of guidance and support from leaders and mentors that have been right where you are. So please go check it out at the Affair Recovery website under the Programs tab. It is always good to be with you. I'll see you again soon. And in the meantime, stay safe and healthy, and we wish you all the best.